Welcome to season two of Minding the Gap, Conversations on Gender. As global gender equality decreases, it is critical to share lessons as we work to turn the tide. From migration to sustainability and politics, we're exploring topics where gender is often overlooked, but inspiring stories emerge. You can listen to the entire series, including the first season, on all the major podcasting platforms, as well as our website at ecdpm.org. Often we look at migration as, as if it's something that affects foreigners. But in many ways, we ourselves have migration histories. But um, also as a woman, I experience the variations between how women and men are treated and the kind of opportunities that both women and men have. This week, we're going to look at the overlap between gender and migration. Migration is one of the most salient political issues in Europe today. Something we often forget, however, is that around half of the world's migrants are women. Understanding the link between gender and migration is therefore essential. So what does gender have to do with migration? How does someone's gender influence the way they move, why they move, and where they move to? And what challenges are there for ensuring research and policy takes a gender-sensitive approach? These are some of the questions we will answer in this week's episode of the podcast. My name's Jamie Slater, working as a researcher in the Migration and Mobility team at ECDPM, and I will be your host for today. My guest for this episode is Omalola Olarinde. Omalola has been researching migration for over a decade. Her other areas of expertise include labor migration, governance, and decoloniality. So, Omalola, welcome. Thank you, Jamie. I'm happy to be here. So, could you start by telling us a bit about why this topic interests you, and why did you get into it? Thanks for asking that, Jamie. As you said at the introduction, gender is a very pertinent topic, um, and how it interacts with migration as well is very important. Um, often we look at migration as, as if it's something that affects foreigners. But in many ways, we ourselves have migration histories. I come from a multiracial and multinational background. My parents and grandparents are from mixed nationalities and mixed races. So it's something that's very close to me. But um, also as a woman, I experience the variations between how women and men are treated and the kind of opportunities and, um, that both women and men have. And so I think that this is a really important topic and one that I'm very passionate about. And so are there any common myths and misunderstandings um, that we have about migration and gender? Oh, yes. In our recent study that we are doing for the European Commission, um, it's the short title is Dynamic, and we're looking at migration aspirations and trajectories and policies. We've just published our report on gender and migration in which we discuss some of what we call taken for granted assumptions about gendered migration. And one of them is that migration decisions are strictly rational. Um, it's true that a lot of um, times migrants weigh their cost and benefits, but there's more to it than this. We looked in the study at the Gallup data, which shows economic preferences and how they differ by gender. And we see, for example, for Nigeria, similar altruistic levels for men and women, but women being less risk-taking and less trusting. And we also see lower convictions to leave among women um, across Africa, but um, slightly so in Nigeria as well. And when we mean convictions to leave, we mean the whole spectrum of aspirations, intentions, plans, and preparations. So um, also Nigerian are slightly more optimistic women than men in Nigeria, although generally we are optimistic in Nigeria. That's interesting. So wh why is it that you think that women in Nigeria are less um, uh, inclined to, to move? Some of it might have to do with social norms, which is another aspect that we discuss in our work, and the idea that they sh should stay closer home. For the Dynamic Project, we have just concluded the qualitative study where we did 
extensive um, detailed interviews with uh, migrant men and women. And we learned from them that um, women have more livelihood pressures than men. And that kind of drives their migration aspirations. But in the absence of those livelihood pressures, women would not want to migrate. So we had in our sample a heterogeneous group of people in terms of um, their income levels, their social status. And so when women didn't have those livelihood pressures, they were less likely to aspire to migrate or when they thought that they were going to have their livelihood pressures met at the source. But that's peculiar to Nigeria. Um, in other African countries, it has a bit to do with religion and social norms. Uh, we looked among a sample that we looked at in the gender paper with Senegal, where women have visibly less gendered migration aspirations than men. And just when you talk about social norms, I wonder, what do you mean exactly? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, well, every society has its own rules governing gendered behavior. Um, and it's really interesting because it's about gender roles and um, the kind of relations that genders can have. And most of the time, these norms uh, indiscriminately affect women. So women are subject to dis more discriminatory practices through these norms. Um, but also um, in countries like Nigeria, those norms are changing. Indeed, the second hypothesis that we wanted people to question was the role of discriminatory social norms and how they restrict migration aspirations or not. And um, interested, there's an interesting study by Miguelian's Copioni in 2019, which showed that the satisfaction with living standards and a uh, a pessimistic view of the future in low-income countries is not associated with more preparations to migrate, but is associated with higher aspirations to migrate. So sometimes women do wish to migrate under discriminatory conditions, but they do not, they do not have the capabilities to do so. But again, I was mentioning an interesting study about Edo women, in which we see that women are challenging social norms and discriminatory norms by finding opportunities for themselves to make a livelihood. So Edo women um, use their migration to um, get finances that allow them to become owners of resources. Yeah, no, I think that's a really uh, interesting point uh, that, yes, of course, migrant women are subject to uh, increased risks, um, but at the same time, they create their own opportunities. Um, and, you know, they're not just simply people in need of care. And from a policy perspective, I think it's really important that policies come in to not only protect migrant women and their uh, specific risks, but also create opportunities uh, for female empowerment. You're absolutely right. Another common misconception is that women are vulnerable, and I, I'm, I'm not denying that they are vulnerable, uh, but as you've rightly pointed out, they find a lot of opportunities to navigate these circumstances that they find themselves in. But also, um, when we think about women as vulnerable, we think about it in relation to men. Uh, um, and I think that it's important to point out that men are also vulnerable. And there are a number of studies that are showing that um, transnational migration allows younger men to um, challenge positions of privilege um, of older men uh, because of their ability to control household resources and how they can resist older men based on the um, finances that they have and the remittances that they send to their country of origin. Presumably, in order to pick up all of these nuances, as a researcher, you need a very flexible approach and you need to give the respondents and the participants in your research the space to uh, express their own experience in its fullness. Is that, is that the case for, in your experience? Absolutely. Um, we noticed that some of the things that we didn't account for um, at the design stage of our instrument showed up. And this is often the case with qualitative research. Um, you have to listen. I, 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 talk, I think about it in the terms of co-creation of knowledge between participants, um, respondents, and the interviewer. 
you have to listen for what nuances the respondents are saying. One of the nuances that we noticed in our own research was when respondents said to us that they thought there was some particular skill that they could achieve from working abroad that was impossible to achieve by remaining at the source country. And that was really interesting because we didn't set out to measure what we eventually called a competitive edge um, because my, um, our respondents thought that once they go abroad, they will acquire some form of competitive edge over those who hadn't been abroad and that once they returned to their source country, that would help them in the labor market. And that was really an interesting finding for us. Yeah, what you just said really resonates with me because at ECDPM, we're trying to think more about um, a decolonizing knowledge approach to research. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to uh, give interview participants really the space not only to express the full range of their experiences, but also to co-create the research process, as you said. So the knowledge production that um, decoloniality scholars are seeking is not just from the researchers themselves, who um, once given the space to participate in the design of the research up until the actual fieldwork and reporting, um, can be of immense importance, but also the knowledge that you can gain from speaking to respondents who are often the people who are affected by um, the research itself. I think it's really important for researchers to consider um, not to consider the knowledge production process apart from the positivist and objective approach to consider how knowledge can be co-constructed. Um, between researcher and participant, and of course also between Global North and Global South scholars, um, allowing Global South scholars some space in framing research questions and designing research instruments, um, and uh, just as our study allows in reporting um, their own findings and being responsible and autonomous in reporting their own findings. Yeah, and presumably there's a gender dimension to this as well, right? So you want to ensure that there's an equal number of female participants in, in research studies and some sort of gender parity when, when working with other researchers? Oh yes, it's really important because um, in spite of all the work that has been done on um, including women, um, it still doesn't happen um, on its own until you mainstream women into the process. So for example, we were purposive about um, our, our respondent selection to be sure that we had women represented. Um, our study itself is designed using a gender action plan in which we have to be purposive about the researchers chosen in the project, um, be purposive about a gender balance. And I think that's really important to mainstreaming women into the process, um, but also in just checking that no one is left behind. Sometimes it's also possible that it could be um, other minority genders or even men that will be left behind. Institutions are increasingly asking for a gender action plan, and particularly at the beginning of the project, I think it's really important um, to think about how the research is going to be sensitive to all gender identities, but also how it's going to mainstream um, genders that are not properly represented. Sometimes that's women and other times that's men or other identities. And I think it's very important for researchers to sit together and think through how they're going to make sure that all genders are well represented in their research. We even designed a checklist that every team lead had to look through before they went into field um, to ensure that they were mainstreaming gender correctly. Thank you. So we've covered a lot of different topics already, looking at how the different ways in which gender influences migration patterns to the importance of decolonizing knowledge approach to doing research. But I wanted to just go back to gender and migration and ask you, what do we still not know about gender and migration? And where is there more research needed? There's a lot we do not know. Um, as you noticed when I was speaking about social norms and how exactly those affect aspirations to migrate. Um, we do know um, a lot about uh, the numbers, but we also need to look a bit more through qualitative studies 
at what exactly are those norms that affect women's migration aspirations and the actual preparations to migrate. I think there still needs to be a lot more research on um, behavioral aspects of decision making, particularly for economies in the global south, where I come from, um, where the emphasis is still on positivism. We need to consider those variables that are showing up as um, influencing factors in migration decision making, such as risk taking, trust and altruism that we mentioned before. I also think it's important to study more deeply the discriminatory social norms, um, but generally social norms and how they are evolving. For example, from our study, we noticed that increasingly um, respondents had the perception that women and men should have equal opportunities, particularly with regards to migration opportunities. But they also often had um, more negative perceptions about women migrants than about men migrants. So, for example, a woman who had a failed migration journey was judged more critically than a man who had had a failed migration journey. And I think that that's important to um, look into in terms of shifting how society um, understands women migrants. And so why do you think that was, that a failed migration journey was looked on worse for women than for men? Part of it has to do with social norms around um marriage and time age of marriage um, because sometimes they mention um, ideas like her time had passed um, so she had passed the age of marriage so to speak but also it has to do with the kind of abuse that women face and how difficult those journeys can be for women particularly women traveling by road and often they come back with um trauma, physical and uh, emotional trauma, that's very difficult to, to um, heal from. And so oftentimes um, our respondents thought that, um, that trauma was reflected differently for men than for women um, and um, could be seen visibly differently on women bodies than on men bodies. Just to be clear, um, we were talking about failed migration, right? Not just migration in general of women. Exactly. Um, most migration journeys were perceived by our respondents as positive, and um, most um, our, of our respondents thought that migrants were in better conditions than they were because we asked questions about financial condition comparison and generally about perceptions about migrants. Um, and when it came to labor migrants, for men and women alike, most of our respondents thought that um, migrants were, had better sources of livelihood um, and that they were doing better than non-migrants. Yeah, that's really interesting that um, the particular vulnerabilities of return uh, migrant women were greater or worse than, than for men. Um, I think there's a, a lot of emphasis on return and reintegration policy within Europe. And a lot of research shows that categorically uh, forced, mi forced return migration is bad for development. But what you're saying is that there may be also a gender dimension within this, that forced return of migrant women may, be, may cause particularly acute vulnerabilities compared to forced return of migrant men. Yes, we did speak to a heterogeneous group um, that included um, return migrants. So this was part of what is normally called um, the voluntary return and reintegration, um, but also of um, labor migrants. And as you rightly differentiated at the start, um, when it came to labor migrants who were returning, particularly documented migrants would often return of their own volition, maybe to attend a ceremony, and they would often um, be people that non-migrants would look up to because of their lifestyle and because of the kind of um, clothes they wore. But this was not the case with um, voluntary assisted return migrants because um, often they came back without much to show for their journeys. We spoke to some experts who were working with these returnees and they, had, they mentioned to us that sometimes they will dress the returnees for the part um, to be able to create a particular image when they returned to their communities um, uh, 
so that they wouldn't be seen as uh, having a failed journey. Um, so it, it was really important um, that we understand that reintegration could be very difficult for someone who's seen as having a failed journey. I think I've heard many times the importance of uh, really tailored and um, attentive care upon reintegration uh, for returning migrants. Um, but Omolola, thank you so much for uh, this conversation. It's been really great to hear your thoughts. And um, yeah. It's been a pleasure speaking with you, Jamie. Thanks a lot.